Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's V Brown Bag. I'm your host, Tom Green, and tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Azure Storage Fundamentals. It's part two or three of our Azure series. Uh, as many of you know, and if you're watching, you've probably been able to find us on YouTube or live. Uh, we can interact with us at V Brown Bag or using the Twitter hashtag V Brown Bag. And with that, I would like to introduce my new co-host, Ken. Say hi, Ken. Yeah, right into the fire. So uh, <laughs> welcome, Ken, to your first V Brown Bag hosting. That's me. And welcome, everybody else. Um, so I think we're just going to kick it off with uh, our, our presenters tonight, Nick Collier and Carl Rottenstrauch. I'm going to try to make you presenter, Nick. OK. You're, you're going to be driving, correct? Yep, yeah, I'll start driving. And yeah, we'll kick it off whenever you're ready. All right. I'm going to kick it your way now. All right, so I have click show screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can. We All can. Right. All right, awesome. So yeah, let's kind of you know get get right into it here. So um, yeah, myself and Carl will kind of drive you through today Azure Storage Fundamentals, as Tom was uh, alluding to there before he uh, lost connection immediately. So uh, what we planned today for the presentation, you know, storage is obviously just a massive topic in itself. Uh, so we wanted to lead off some of the VM discussions that have happened, kind of cover VM storage first of all, storage accounts, blob storage, and then just, you know, some principles around storage access um, that we'll go through. So. Um, bear with us, a bit of a brief background on myself. So um, I'm currently a solutions principal at um, AHEAD and I'm an Azure practice lead there as well. I'm also a founder and instructor for Azure certifications at Skylines Academy, which you can get the link there. And we got a nice coupon code for you that the Brown Bag team allowed me to, to give everybody today. Uh, I blog as well and you know, I've got experience in AWS automation and orchestration, but I definitely have shifted and I'm way more passionate about Azure than any other cloud. And now I've sort of diverted all my attention there. So, uh, so that's where I, I focus now. Um, this is the code we'll give you, um, you know, it'll be out, you know, it's obviously recorded, but obviously jot it down if you want to. If you go to Skylines Academy, use vbrownberg50 and you'll get 50% off the Azure certification class that I teach over there and on Udemy as well. Um, but with that said, we're going to jump straight into uh, blob storage first of all. I'm just going to break this slide out. I think one of the key things that's important for everybody just to realize, you know, when we talk about storage in Azure, and particularly we talk about blob storage, and if you're not familiar with the acronym, blob storage that stands for binary large object. Uh, and essentially it's a backbone for almost every single service that we that we connect to in Azure. So whether it's app and web scale, uh, backups and archive, big data from IoT, genomics, et cetera, there are so many scenarios that ultimately connect to those. So while we obviously are only, you know, focusing on a, a shorter presentation today around just the fundamentals, uh, know that this connects into almost every single service out there. And in many cases, there's the ability to make the blob store that you create, as you'll see throughout this demonstration, you know, available to any service that you pretty much provision in Azure itself. And I think that's, you know, pretty important there. Uh, so with that, let's jump straight, straight into kind of VM storage, first of all, um, to kind of, you know, evolve from kind of the virtual machines intro that, that's happened previously. Uh, and the first thing to understand is there are two types of storage available to you, and it's pretty common sense. You know, standard storage is backed by your traditional hard disk drives. These are still spinning disk. Uh, these are the most cost effective, obviously, to do, but naturally, given that they're not SSDs, as you'll see in a moment, uh, the maximum throughput is only 60 megabytes per second. Maximum IOPS is currently, you know, 500 IOPS per disk. Uh, and one of the things, you know, when we say per disk, it is common now uh, in cloud to, to RAID disks. Again, you can add multiple disks and RAID them on your servers. It's, it's perfectly acceptable to do that. Um, when we get to premium storage now, we're backed by SSD drives. So obviously there's a cost increase for this and I've got a little bit about cost at the end if we want to get into it. Um, but we get much, much higher performance, maximum throughput 250 megabytes a second per disk and maximum IOPS of 7,500 IOPS per disk. So again, you can see if you if you add multiple disks to your to your machines, you will you will obviously get you know greater greater speed and throughput there. If we look at it in more detail, one of the things you'll notice is when you add storage or you go to the Azure price calculator, the storage, you know, you, you can certainly type in your amounts and it's going to give you the price. 
But the way uh, Microsoft does this is by SKU size. So, you know, in standard storage, you'll see everything from S4 up to S50. And, you know, I, I will say caveat here, these numbers and, and SKUs change on, like, I wouldn't say daily basis, but every quarter we kind of have to kind of constantly um, check these uh, because they're constantly changing. But when you when you think about it from this point of view, yeah, when you go above the 32 gig, you're basically into the S6 now. When you go above 64, you're into the S10. Um, and, and that's how your pricing is calculated, is based on the SKU of the disk. Uh, the maximum IOPS for all sizes um, that you see above is 300 IOPS per disk, as was kind of previously mentioned, and the maximum throughput for all of these is 60 megabytes a second. So when you're looking at standard disks, again, spinning disk, there's, there's not too much to worry about from an IOPS and, and megabytes a second point of view, because it's fairly consistent throughout. Um, when we move up to premium disks, you can see again, we have a whole bunch of SKUs. Now we use P for premium and our various numbers that we have across the top there. Uh, and you know, again, based on disk size, you'll fit into the correct SKU. But you will notice that the IOPS and the um, throughput obviously varies based on the SKU that you've got here. In fact, you'll notice based on kind of the, as you kind of design things out, if you're in the P4, P6 range, uh, you have to consider that um, a standard disk potentially could have, you know, achieve greater IOPS and, and megabytes a second of throughputs. However, it's not as guaranteed as something on a premium disk, which obviously is, is going to be more reliable, you know, from a throughput perspective. Um, but if you can see here, if you want to get into the 7,500 IOPS, you're basically up at those P40, P50 disks there. Um, a sweet spot for a lot of people is around about like the P15, P20 for a lot of VMs I see, but obviously it's all dependent on the apps you're deploying and the, the storage you're trying to deploy there. So um, so that's kind of the disks in itself. The other thing you have to yeah, think about. Uh, just oh, just real yeah. quick, Nick. Yeah, sorry, before we jump into this, which, which is a really important topic, I think everybody's going to enjoy this, especially if you do a lot of uh, LUN and virtual disk provisioning today, you're going to love what Nick is about to talk about. But uh, on the prior slide where you saw the differences between standard disks and premium disks, you may have been scratching your head and, and saying, wow, why, why isn't there something in the middle? Why, you know, why is there this big gap between these two? And just recently, we released what, uh, what we're referring to as the standard SSD tier. So the standard SSD tier is that nice middle ground between the two. It doesn't offer the extreme performance range that you see here in terms of uh, IOPS per disk and throughput, uh, throughput per disk. It, it fits right in between standard and premium and provides consistent performance, the low latency that you would expect from SSDs. But the IOPS are, are capped uh, below what you see here. Premium is still the uh, offering if, if you need max IOPS, max throughput. Standard offers more predictable performance than you get from spinning uh, magnetic media, standard SSD, which uh, those of us who have been in storage for a long time, you know uh, your performance will vary anytime you've got uh, spinning spinning tin, spinning rust there yeah. uh, behind your application. And, and we did a, a nice thing by providing um, something that, that you know, meets those, those specific needs. So that's good to know. So already, you know, I have to add a uh, third slide in here to kind of cover the, <laughs> the advancements, just the nature of cloud. Welcome to <laughs> Azure, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but that's awesome, dear. Uh, so that that's great. And um, yeah, so that's and and I will say just on that slide as well, like don't get too hung up on the SKUs and the size. I mean, you go to the pricing calculator, you put your size in, it's it's going to tell you what you know what it is. And and when you'll see when we actually add a disk to a VM in a little bit, um, it'll kind of show you those numbers as you add in the disk. So it's not like you have to go and do a whole bunch of design work ahead of time. You can you can get in there and see pretty transparently what's what's going to happen. Um, but moving on to unmanaged versus managed disks and and. I think this is a key thing because for a long time, unmanaged disks were the only way. You know, they were kind of this do-it-yourself option of putting your disks together, um, but you had this management overhead because when you create a storage account and you put your disks in your storage account, you had this 20,000 IOPS per storage account limit, but it did support all the replication modes. Um, and we'll get more into those a little bit later on, but there's locally replicated, geographically replicated, et cetera, which, which we'll hit on. But managed disks have come along, and you know I certainly encourage everybody wherever possible use managed disks unless you have some outline use case. You don't really want to get into the the business if possible of of managing your disks that you know from a storage account perspective. Managed disks are just you know completely taken care of for you. You add them to the VM, and Azure kind of kind of takes care of that for you. 
The one thing I'll say is, while the only LRS replication mode is available, that means you can only locally replicate a managed disk currently, and this call is about to tell me that's changed. Um, you can, um, you, you can you still use Azure Backup to you know backup and recover in in other regions, um, but LRS is still currently um, the only replication mode available there. Yeah, that is correct. No changes there, and you know really what we offer for replication from a disk perspective and a VM perspective is our Azure Site Recovery. Uh, solution. Yeah, exactly. And to clarify, so LRS, when you see this out there, this is, um, I shouldn't say logically, we've got a, got a typo in our slide there. This is locally replicated uh, storage. So this is uh, replicated three times uh, within a storage scale unit. So storage scale unit is your collection of racks of storage nodes in the in the data center in the same region as your storage account uh, was created. Uh, when we move up, um, ZRS, which has undergone some changes, this is essentially, you know, multiple data centers, but still in the in the same region, potentially there. Uh, the one that a lot of our, um, certainly my customers that are ahead, utilize uh, is geographically replicated storage, you know, particularly for like database disks on SQL and things like that. If they've got specific reasons that, hey, I really want to make sure that in the event of a complete outage to this um, to this region, I can recover that machine in another region. And this is something I, I, I tell people a lot is, you know, there's, there's always a lot of press around whenever, you know, one of the big cloud providers has an outage to a region. And if you do plan appropriately, it's not to say every application you want to pay for GRS, but where you do have those critical applications and you need to recover in another region, GRS is an option, you know, basically has a disk running in the other region and you can mount that to a VM and, and power that VM back on. Um, and then you also have the option of read-only geographically replicated storage or read access as, as it is the RA-GRS. Um, and this provides read access. You can access the disk uh, even while, you know, your VM's running in the current region. And when I say access, you can't obviously do any writes or anything to it. It's just, it's purely read access. But if you needed to access it in the other region, it is, it is hot and ready uh, for that purpose. So we look at the replication strategies. This table kind of summarizes them for you. So between LRS, DRS, GRS, RA, GRS, um, you know, the, the one that's replicated across multiple data centers, it starts at ZRS, GRS, multiple regions. Um, the other key thing, if you look at the bottom row, is the number of copies of data maintained on separate nodes. When you get into GRS, you know, that's six copies of your data uh, in, you know, that are being replicated. And I think, you know, if you try to do these things, typically on premises and your data center, you know, I come from a, a VMware background and, you know, it's just, it's, it's complicated to kind of do a lot of these things where here it's kind of more of a, more of a checkbox if you kind of, kind of need that kind of you know, replication available to you. So with that said, Carl, if you want to add anything else, I'm going to just go in and show um, at a very basic level, you know, just so everyone's seen, I don't know if we covered this completely in the, um, VMs module before um, when we kind of ran the brown bag, but I built a VM here that we can kind of just run into in an empty Azure account. Um, yeah, I was going to say, well, you're getting set up with the demo, just, yeah. uh, just to clarify for the audience real quick, um, you know, as, as Nick said, uh, locally redundant storage is the option that's supported for VM disks. The GRS and the read uh, access GRS is, is uh, supported for the object storage that, that we're going to talk about here uh, later. The, uh, the zone redundant, which protects you against a rack and a data center failure, uh, can be leveraged with VMs in, uh, in what we call an availability set. And uh, that is probably a conversation all to itself for, yeah. uh, for another podcast, but uh, just an ultra availability option. Yep, that's yeah, that's a good point. Yes, we do have a question that yeah, came go ahead. Uh, Amy Manley asks, is standard SSD GA? Uh, so standard SSD is in public preview, and uh, what does that mean? That's one of those kind of obscure, specific to Azure terms, uh, and uh, it means a couple of different things. So uh, public preview is an offering, it's a service within Azure that is fully supported as a production deployment. What it, it means and why we don't say GA is based on the availability. So public preview offerings are not available in all of our data centers. We move those out and scale those out across our data centers as uh, we get the infrastructure in place and have the, uh, the ability to, um, to provide that service everywhere. So when you hear something referred to as GA, that's something that's, uh, that's online in, in, uh, in our regions uh, all over the world, public preview. 
uh, has a, a uh, restricted footprint, and um, but is still supported as a production offering. Call support for help. You get help. That is a production quality uh, solution. Confusing, I know. We uh, why we can't use terms that are a little more meaningful. I I don't know, <laughs> but I'm not in marketing, folks. <laughs> Any other questions, Tom, or uh, should we keep going? Uh, the question box is clear, uh, so All right. keep on going. All right, so yeah, so what you're seeing on screen then is I've got this resource group um, called V Brown Bag. For anyone who just didn't attend any of the other sessions, the resource group is essentially just a container in Azure. It is a place that I can do RBAC permissions on and policy on, but think of it just as a container where I can put objects in for Azure. So it helps me organize everything, you know, services that share, the same life cycle, I would put in the same resource group. And then when I'm done with everything, I can just delete this resource group. And it won't just delete the virtual machine, it'll delete the disk, the network interface, the public IP address I've got here, everything else. So just to just to kind of clarify that, it's, a, it's definitely something you want to kind of plan for when you setting up your Azure environment. Uh, so I've got this virtual machine here, VBB01, V Brown Bag 01, uh, kept it nice and simple. And if we go into disks at this point, you know, you'll see here we have the OS disk that that comes with the machine we built. And I built this one on premium SSD, no encryption enabled and host caching, which we'll come into um, later on. Um, you'll learn more about, but that's set to read right by default on the OS disk. The other thing to note, you'll see this message at the top that always appears, which I think is a good reminder for people. Since June 10th of last year, um, you know, all managed disks created are encrypted at rest with storage service encryption. Um, now that doesn't mean you've got BitLocker encryption enabled on top of that. You know, you, you still want to do that if you if you need to. Um, but you know, it's it's worth knowing noting that you know storage service encryption is is enabled there, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but to add a disk, it's pretty simple. I mean, anybody that's kind of coming from a VMware background, you used to go in and edit in your VM and add in a disk. Same kind of concept. You know, add a data disk. Um, click it in here. You'll see here you, you kind of have the, the, the LUN number and then you choose yet. Yeah. If you had a, a data disk already out there, uh, we could select them. But in my case, I'm going to create a new disk. So if I click create disk, it'll take me to another blade, as we call them in Azure, to create that managed disk. I can give it a name. So we'll kill this VBB disk 2. Uh, I could choose my resource group that I want to put that disk in. So in my case, I will put that in the brown bag with everything else that I have here. It's going to be in the same location. You know, we did talk briefly about availability zones. We can, that's certainly a, a future topic, um, but it's not coming up here at this point, given that we're not in the availability sets here. Uh, I choose then the uh, account, you know, the account type. So premium SSD, HDD, but it sounds like on the call, we'll, we'll see a third option there if you opt into the, the public preview. Um, you know, if I want to do a source disk, uh, disk for this too, I can, um, and then I've basically got my size. And this is what I wanted to focus on. So if you see on the bottom here, um, you know, I've got my estimated performance based on the size, and you saw that calculation in the, in the PowerPoint presentation. So if I do jump up to 2048, you can see that kind of jumps up here to 7,500 IOPS limit and the throughput increases. So that, that does go up based on the size of this because obviously we, we're getting the, the biggest SKU size at that point. So, um, so if I go ahead and click create, that will create that disk for us. Just take a moment here for it to validate. We do have a question while it's validating here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, SSE means that Microsoft has the private key for the encryption. Yeah, so yeah, SSE, now correct me if I'm wrong, Carl, we can, you can use your own key as well using Key Vault, but by default, that is the, the scenario that happens. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. So we do give that choice. We find that, you know, some customers say, hey, I, I don't want to be responsible for the key management. You guys do that. House those keys for me, generate those keys. You can, of course, uh, rotate keys and, and have control over that uh, that process. But we have a, a subset of customers, and I, I can certainly understand this. I worked in regulated industries who uh, who want to own that that key um, end to end, and and we do support that. Nick is spot on. Yep. And uh, with that said, so it comes back to the screen because again, now I'm adding the disk that I've created. So again, you're creating a disk, and then now we're attaching it to the uh, to the machine itself, um, and now I don't click this box here, I click save at the top, and that's now going to attach that disk, and if we logged into the Windows VM, did a rescan, we would see it just like any other any other disk that you add, you know, historically to a virtual machine. You will notice 
that host caching by default is read only. Again, we'll come come on to that later, but just note that you would need to change it here if you if you wanted to. Um, anything else you want to add, Carl? Otherwise, I'm going to kind of keep going through here. No, perfect, nailed it. Okay. Uh, so then let's move on. I just updated the slide. This is another one that changed. I just found out today. You know, I had a 500 terabytes as the uh, the maximum storage account size here, and I and that was actually increased. Uh, so five petabytes is now the maximum size of a storage account and a blob container. So we're going to come onto blob in a, in a little bit, but you will notice as well, if we think of a, a page blob, which is the type of uh, disk that we're using here for our VM storage, eight terabytes is the, the maximum disk size that we can, we can currently, excuse me, add to our, to our virtual machines. Um, but we'll hit more of that a little bit later. Uh, let's hit disk caching here for a minute. So just if anyone's not familiar with disk caching, this is essentially a method for improving the performance of our VHDs that are ultimately, you know, behind the scenes here, uh, you know, those disks that we've added to the machine. Uh, and what it does is it utilizes local RAM and SS SSD drives on the underlying VM host. So think about it is on the, the compute nodes, the racked servers that Microsoft has in the data centers, just like, you know, if you're again familiar with on-premises, you may have put an SSD in your VMware host and said, hey, I want to kind of speed up a speed up a drive or a virtual machine using that using that technology you know you could do it that way same concept here but it uses ram as well um, as local ssd so essentially instead of you instead of the um, hardware the compute node having to go back to the, the storage array to actually go and get that data it can cache it locally right next to the you know the machine that's actually actually running in memory uh, and that just gives a you know a massive speed boost and and needed and it's a way you can do this on standard and premium disks so you could speed up standard um, disks by adding the uh, caching uh, and if you look at this you know think about it from this point of view so OS disks by default read write caching you know you can certainly change that if you want to but read write is naturally encouraged on the on the OS disk a data disk you know default is is none typically I think it's actually been changed to read only as I saw when I kind of added that managed disk there today so again this might need a little bit of an update um, but you know you can go to read write as well. Now, read only caching is great where we you know want to improve latency and potentially gain like higher IOPS per disk. That's it's a little bit less predictable, obviously, given that it is caching. Um, it's not guaranteed. Like if we just choose the correct disk in the first place, um, read write caching. You know you have to ensure though. Like so, you've got to be a little bit careful with SQL servers on this you have to ensure you have a proper way to write data from cache to persistent disks uh, and so it's not for everyone on the read write but os disk you know great for things like that um, but um yeah re read write on, on databases and things you just got to be careful and there's some best practices out there for that as well but certainly a way if you want to kind of you know amp up or, or get a little bit more speed you know you can enable that as well so we did um, have a question just come go. in regarding yeah, go uh caching by the way uh, Graham wants to know, is there any performance gain with caching an SSD? Yeah, there can be just from the, the fact that it's local RAM. I wouldn't say it's going to be as significant um, as obviously if you did it on a standard disk, but they could potentially be gain there as well. And, you know, mileage varies on these things. So you'd have to kind of test it with your workload and, and, and see. Uh, I probably haven't got as much data, you know, I mean, obviously I've got customers that kind of turn it on, and but I don't think I've had enough people kind of measure like, hey, it was, I got this much throughput and this much latency before and and after. Um, it's it sort of all been, yeah, it, it helps and it helped improve speed. But Carl, maybe you've got some maybe specific metrics or anything on that, like any percentages people have seen increases or? Yeah, we've got some great, uh, we've got some great data on that out in the um, Azure documentation site. So uh, I'll tell you folks who may be, who may be new to Azure on, on the call here, it's, it's refreshing the amount of information that, uh, that we share. I, I really wish every, every vendor was as transparent with, um, uh, with the information around best practices and performance and, and upper limits of, uh, of their solutions. And you can head to docs.microsoft.com, uh, hit the Azure logo, and then you'll see we break everything down by service. So you expand storage, uh, expand disks, and uh, you'll see we, we've actually got an article about the, the impact of caching and uh, the profile of workloads that, uh, that benefit from it. So uh, a ton of information out there at your fingertips. No guesswork required. You can go and get your answers from uh, black and white public documentation. 
Okay, great. And you know, if we do want to enable caching, it is really as simple. You can do this by PowerShell. You can go into the portal. We're obviously doing a lot via the portal today, um, just for visualization. Um, but just go in here. You can see that disk got created, and simply go in there and you know, change it to read write if we wanted to. Hit save, and you know, good good to go from that point of view. And yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to kind of check out the documentation Carl mentioned, but potentially also just you know try it. You know, if you've got a workload that you think could benefit from it, and then you know measure before and after and kind of see what you what you get as well um, so with that that's kind of cash in there I'll mention a few of the other services here just as they relate to VMs they kind of come up you know every time I talk about blob they come up every time I talk about VMs they come up but um, there are Azure file services as well these are just an easy way to create file shares they support SMB 2.1 and they support SMB 3.0 which is secured you can mount them on Windows Linux or Mac you can go into Azure create a file share and if we've, we've got time we certainly can do it you know at the end today um, you know but go and create one of these and, and literally just mount it you know as an SMB share you know on, on your machine uh, and this can be utilized you know to improve access from you know on-premises systems with file sync as well um, so that's a mechanism also where if you've got files on-premises and you want to kind of get them up but you let me rephrase that a little bit. So let's say you've got people on your in your um, in your data center that want to basically get access files in the share. They can use file sync, and then it, it, uh, certain files are synced locally to improve their access, you know, to them as well. So it's kind of like you deploy a virtual machine, enable file sync, and then it's syncing files from the the public Azure down into into your data center. Uh, in addition, I'll kind of hit the limits already so I'll, I'll jump through that um, here's a quick note on the storage service encryption so this is encryption at rest uh, just to clarify you know for everybody there again it's automatically enabled with managed disks it's enabled at the storage account level if you want to do it for unmanaged disks so we did talk about you know managed versus unmanaged um, and if you do want to do it for unmanaged disks you have to go into the, the storage account level itself and do it and that's where you can do some of the work around your own keys as well that we talked about uh, and this is very important as well. Uh, when you are doing at the storage account level, only new files added to the account uh, will be encrypted. So if you change it in, in the account level, you're obviously gonna have a lot of files there that maybe aren't encrypted and then you turn on SSE, those new files will be encrypted. You have to you know, remove the files and re-add re them to the storage account to, to turn them on for, um, for SSE. Uh, disk encryption, you know, you've probably heard about this too. So this is encryption at rest with your industry standard encryption system that you might have. Windows, it's BitLocker. Linux drives are encrypted using DMcrypt. Uh, again, you can find a lot of documentation on there. Um, but this is where if you want to meet those regulatory requirements, you know, ISVMs all use customer control keys and policies allow an audit in, you know, of Key Vault as well. So, you know, you can use your own keys. BitLocker encrypt your Windows servers, use, use DM encrypt, uh, DMcrypt for your Linux drives, and you control the keys to the kingdom uh, for that VM disk encryption. So uh, combined with SSE, you can add this on top, and then you've got you know full end-to-end -end encryption of your disks. Uh, Carl, anything you want to add on that, or am I good with that? Yeah, real quick. Uh, it yeah. is amazing how fast and furious everything changes. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, so we with, with the storage service encryption, the, the account level encryption, uh, we mentioned earlier, well, I, I should say Nick mentioned earlier that um, encryption is on by default for all new accounts. What, what we uh, announced recently and what we've started doing as well is uh, going back and encrypting at rest all of our uh, customer accounts for them. So, you know, we've, we've made the statement, we're obviously committed to your, uh, the privacy, the sensitivity of your data, the security of your data, and uh, we are, are retroactively uh, encrypting those accounts as well. So you'll see uh, even the, the objects that were placed in Blob uh, accounts previously will uh, will inherit that encryption. That's um, our commitment to your privacy and the security of your data. This is why I love Microsoft. I got to ask Carl to join. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's um, so that's VM disks. That's kind of one half, not even a half, right? It's like one hundredth of everything we want to talk about in storage. But uh, I did want to move on to kind of blobs and uh, potentially Azure files if we uh, if we get time today uh, and kind of hit that. I'm just going to jump through this slide real quick. This is kind of more of an overview. Um, so you've heard us talk a lot about storage accounts, managed disks, and I, I did want to kind of like take a step back at this point. 
as we looked at adding disks and we've got managed disks and unmanaged disks and we get, okay, we can add those to VMs and we can turn on encryption and we can turn on caching and all those things. But how do we just create a binary large object store if we just want to throw a bunch of images and things up there? And so the center of all that, as you probably guessed by now, just as in terms of how we've been talking, is the storage account. And so you can go into Azure, you can create a storage account, and now there can be up to five petabytes of, of data they can, they can essentially hold in there. Uh, underneath your storage account is your container, which think of this as more around organization, but also as an area you can, you know, if you need to kind of control permissions at as well. Uh, and then in your container, in your blob storage account, it goes, you know, your images, your JPEGs, your AVIs and, and things like that. And I think this is an important point. A, a lot of people have kind of already moved from file systems to, to blob stores and kind of understand the difference. But I will say there's definitely still a, a trend where a lot of people historically said, "Hey, I need a file system, or I need, you know, I need a SIF share or something." And and in many cases, you don't, right? For a lot of things, like particularly for a lot of web applications, we find it's better just to, you know, let's give you a blob store and let's put all the images and videos and things things out there. Uh, it's just a smarter way to kind of organize those things that are kind of accessed a little bit more, a little bit differently versus your documents and things like that that obviously make more sense on a on a file share. So, um, so think of your blob. It's just it's a container you can throw all your you know your objects on there images videos whatever you know that you want to put on there and, and access them you know in various mechanisms that we'll we'll kind of talk about as we go through there are a number of storage account types now general purpose version one um, and blob accounts were kind of the first ones that were ultimately around so when you wanted to create blob store you would use a blob account if you when you were doing unmanaged disks you would use gpv version one for your general purpose storage account uh, one of the things i'm very pleased about is just gpv2 storage accounts that are out now because you can you can mix and match in there you know between you know um, blobs and disks and, and whatever you want to put in there. So I think a GPV2 is, you know, kind of all, all encompassing. There are use cases, and again, they're documented on the Microsoft site where it might make a little more sense to use a blob account. Maybe if it's just blobs you're storing and, and you've got a certain use case and could be a little bit cheaper, but uh, the general recommendation I make is to just go with GPV2 and, and not worry about it. So. Yeah, that's a solid one, Nick. And you know, you you see us innovating and adding more capabilities to GPV2, and not that either one of the the other types will be deprecated. We have no plans to do that uh, at this time. But GPV2 is is where you're starting to see advancements like uh, Azure Data Lake and the HDFS endpoint uh, being placed on on top of it. So you you now have the capability in that one account, in that one five petabyte account to support uh, big data, uh, data sets, to support images and, and videos, kind of the, the traditional type of, of content that you would see in an object store, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so on and so forth. That's, uh, you know, that's really gonna be an innovation platform for us and provide uh, some great capabilities going forward. I, I think you'll all be excited about when we can announce them. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and also to clarify then, so again, we've talked about, you know, block blobs and page blobs. And again, page blobs, you know, can still be stored in the account. Um, if we, again, if we do an unmanaged disk, efficient for read-write operations on the right here, used by your VMs, eight terabytes in size, block blobs up to 4.75. I did hear potentially five terabytes in size. I don't know if somebody was just rounding up or that is the new size, um, but, you know, we're close enough either way there. Um, for your block blobs. And then there are such things as append blobs as well for like login and, and append operations as well that you can kind of store in there. But think of your block blob, you know, text, binary files, you know, images, videos, you know, those kind of things. The other really great thing, um, something I really love about the way storage accounts work is we have these storage tiers. And when you create something, and certainly if you're ever doing a demo or anything, or just, you know, like, we, like we're doing here, and you'll see in a moment, you know, there's there's a hot tier of storage, which is, you know, higher storage costs, but lower access costs. So think about it, if you're accessing the data more frequently, that's, you know, hot data, we, we're accessing it frequently, um, might pay a little bit more for the storage as a whole, but I'm going to pay much uh, less access costs because I'm telling Microsoft, hey, I want to I wanna access this data more frequently. Then we've got cold storage, which has lower storage costs, but we, we pay, you know, a higher access cost. Now think about it this way, if you're, you're intending for that data, um, that's going to remain cool for 30 days or more. Cold storage makes more sense because I'm not accessing it frequently. I might be accessing this file every 30 days, move it into a, a cold tier. 
excuse me, and then uh, archive storage, lowest storage costs, highest retrieval costs. Um, think of this as just, you know, this is offline. It takes time for it to come, you know, to be retrieved, to be rehydrated. Um, but this is kind of meant for, you know, hey, I, I don't need to access this. And maybe you've got records I need to keep and things like that. And, you know, I want to access later on. There's also through Azure Automation now, the mechanism to, you know, automatically move move data up and down. So, you know, Azure started to build things into the, the platform itself that, you know, if it reads, you know, you can turn the auto tier in on and then essentially have it kind of move down the tiers as needed, you know, if you're not accessing that data frequently and then you can pay a, a lower storage cost for that. Um, so recapping again, if anyone's gotten lost between blobs, files and disks, so, Blobs, access application data from anywhere, large amounts of objects to store images, videos, you know, I'm kind of hitting this over and over. Files, you still got those, you can have access files, access files across multiple machines, jump box scenarios, things like that. And then disks as well. This is more for your VMs, do not need to access the data outside of the VM. Lift and shift of machines from on-premises, disk expansion, that's where you're, you're ultimately going to use, uh, use disks there. So, I'm going to show you how to create a storage account uh, in the Azure portal as well. So we'll just come out of the, uh, the disk we had previously. We'll go back to the brown bag here. And this is our resource group. Uh, and we'll go in here and simply click add. And there's multiple ways to add a resource if anyone's still getting new to Azure. So I'm doing it from here. I'm in the resource group. I'm just, just familiar place I do it. But you could go to the top left, click create a resource. We can do it under all services. We can find it, you know, there's, there's plenty of options. You know, we could choose storage accounts and, and go in here. But uh, yeah, if you just click create a resource and type in storage account, you'll see immediately comes up storage account, blob, file, table, queue, because those are the different um, services that we can put, utilize on top of that storage account. Uh, click create, like any Azure service, and give it a name. Storage accounts do have a, a more, um, intriguing, I'll say naming convention, but uh, we'll call this one VBB storage account. Uh, you can't have capital letters and things in these. Um, you know, I don't know if we've covered too much of classic throughout the series. If, if anybody's just not aware of it, the resource manager model is certainly the, the ARM model as you hear people talk about the resource providers that we use. Everything we do is ARM based now. Classic is really if you've got legacy classic, you know, Microsoft went through kind of a, a major update a few years ago. Uh, and so, you know, if, if in doubt, just choose resource manager. There shouldn't be any reason you're choosing classic anymore these days, especially if you're new to Azure. Uh, yeah, just, agreed, you know, yeah. agreed. The right answer is always resource manager. Exactly. <laughs> in fact, even if you've got classic resources, it's resource manager, right? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, unless you've got some <laughs> weird use case, yeah. Um, <laughs> And notice that this will check the, you know, this is a publicly accessible um, DNS entry. So it will kind of, this has to be unique um, that's out there. Um, so it'll create this and I'll get into kind of the custom domain naming um, in a little bit um, with everyone here. Uh, but then we choose our account kind, right? So you can see there we got uh, GPV1, GPV2, blob storage. So we'll choose GPV2 in this case uh, and choose our location, uh, which I'll just go with the East US at this point. And then as Carl mentioned earlier, you know, we can choose LRS, GRS or RAGRS when we're dealing with blob storage. ZRS was more for the the availability and zones and sets for the, the VMs. It's LRS, GRS and, and RAGRS we've got here. So in my case, I just want this locally replicated. Uh, and then I get down to choosing my performance. So again, we talked about standard and premium. So if I want it on SSD, I'll choose the premium storage. If I want it on standard, I'll choose standard storage there. Uh, then we get into the access tier. So again, that was around how we, you know, how often we're going to access the data. So again, if it's cool or hot, you know, in my case, I'm, I'm just gonna put some images up now. Um, so I'm gonna access that hot. And this is a new one I haven't seen yet. So maybe Carl, you can talk about this. It's just for secure transfer requirements. Uh, yeah, so they're, um, as Nick mentioned, you know, these uh, these accounts are, are publicly accessible. There's a there's a URL, you can see that at the at the top of the interface here. You can restrict the traffic to uh, HTTPS only, and uh, there's a couple of other new settings here. Um, you had another location been chosen, you you would actually see the GRS uh, replication option as well. I think in East US too. Uh, it was in uh, GRS. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, ZRS. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was thinking one thing and saying another. Okay. East um, US too. Let's try it. Yep. There we go. Zone redundant storage. So. 
There you go. Yeah, and just another feature that's still in public preview. So you know, it's not available in, in every region, but um, you know, great capabilities there. And as you scroll down the list, the virtual networks uh, option is something that it has been um, delivered due to customer demand and, and for good reason. Yeah, so, in fact, um, I mean, I've dealt with that a lot with customers. Is not everybody, you know, you might want this blob store to only be accessible to your virtual networks that you create, you know, in Azure. So, you know, in fact, one of the customers we had, we deployed a SQL Server data warehouse as a service, and we wanted to attach a, a blob account to that, but didn't want it accessible to anything else. So, you know, essentially, you know, we configured it to only be accessible to that that particular network. Perfect case in point. And if you do need it accessible externally, but you only want it accessible to uh, folks and applications within your company, you can restrict it to the CIDR block addresses that, or individual IP addresses that you own to prevent you know, anyone from trying to get access that, uh, that shouldn't have it, in addition to all the other security me mechanisms we have in place. Yeah, and so moving uh, moving on the subscription, yeah, again, if you kind of covered the initial um, V Brown bags, you know, I mean, I've got two subscriptions in my account here. Yeah? Um, so, so that's just, you know, the subscription that's going to be built for this. And then the uh, the resource group. So in my case, I'm using V Brown bag, you know, I'm putting all my objects in there together. I'm not going to do anything with virtual networks like we just described. And then I'm going to go ahead and, and click create. Um, at this point, we're not going to get into any uh, data lake Gen 2 that's just just been added to the dashboard there as well today, maybe a future one. Uh, so we'll give that a moment. They don't take too long to, to, to take effect. You can kind of you know, check the status here and we can give it a, a refresh a few times. I'll go straight over to, it's probably already there, even if the portal's not updated. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's ridiculous how fast that is, up to five petabytes <laughs> in capacity in 30 seconds. That's uh, it, it, just outrageous. Anybody just who like managed that. to SANS <laughs> in the past, SAN or NAS in the past, you can, you can certainly appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and so if we, you know, look at the account now. Now I've got those options. And I kind of mentioned, you know, blobs, files, tables, queues. I'll kind of go into tables and queues a little bit more um, at the end here with, with Carl. But, you know, for, for the purpose of today, if we kind of go into blobs, you know, I mentioned kind of a container. So the first thing I want to do is just create that container. Um, and we'll kind of call this VBB container for the purposes of, again, today. And then I've got this public access level. So for right now, I'm going to create this container, but I don't want it to be accessible publicly. And you'll notice you have three levels here. So private, no anonymous access. So any of the images and things we put in here are going to be completely private to me. If I want to have access to the, the blobs only, I can choose this one. Or if I want to have anonymous read access to the container and everything inside it, as well as the blobs, then I can kind of set it at that container level. Um, but for right now, we'll choose private, click OK, and then go into VBB container. Uh, and you can see here, I can click upload and I, I can do various things. Probably not the most efficient way to do it, so we'll show you uh, another way to do it, which is if we go back to the account uh, and select uh, Storage Explorer here, there's a couple ways to access Storage Explorer. It's now built in directly into the Azure portal, or you can download the thick client, which, you, which I encourage you to do, um, add it to your machine, and then you can authenticate against your Azure account. So what you would do, is going in. I'll see if this will actually uh, connect me today because actually I my account's through uh, GoDaddy here right now, so it might actually they were having an issue today. So we'll see if it uh, works, and I'll show you how how we connect that in. Yeah, we may be in business now. So there we go. So it brings up the sign on screen, and then I can click sign in. See if I got my password right. So there you go. You can see the subscriptions that are in my Azure account. I click apply, and now it connects in. So the Skyline's primary subscription was the one I was using, and now you can also see we've got the storage account here. And if I expand our blob containers, you can see we have that new 
VBB container there as well. Um, and at this point, now I can upload you know, a series of files. So I can just go in, say upload files. I'm gonna select um, you know, just a bunch of images. I've got like an image sample here you know, on, the, on the desktop. You know, I'll select four files at this point and click upload. And now they will, they will get uploaded into you know, that container itself. And there you can see they're already there. And at this point also, you can make snapshots here, manage snapshots. If I wanna make a snapshot of this image, I can do that. And then I can actually go in and you know, look at manage snapshots and see, oh, okay, I created that snapshot. I can promote that snapshot um, back. And then you can see that tells me, okay, if I promote it, it's going to overwrite um, the base blob because I've you know, chosen to promote this particular snapshot. So what you would expect kind of, you know, from a you know, snapshot manager on there. Uh, the next thing though is let's say I want to actually go and access this. Well, the first thing I, I would try to do is, okay, if I copy the URL and we'll get into shared access signatures in a minute uh, and just try to access the file, uh, it's going to give me a deny because we went through that, that private access option. But what I can also do is generate, if I right click it and say, get a shared access signature, uh, this will actually give me uh, oh, something interesting happening there. Let's see if that still works. We'll still create it, see what happens. Um, let's just go ahead with that. Um, but essentially, set shared access signature gives temporary access to that particular file with a secure string. Uh, so you, and I'll go through the details of those in a minute, but you can see now I can actually access that. So I'm giving, giving out permissions essentially for that. Uh, and there's also something called shared access signature policies, which allow me to more, more accurately control these signatures that I'm giving out. I can apply a policy and say, okay, I wanna allow access from this day to this date um, and time, and I wanna give read or write access, you know, and, and kind of control it that way. But, but you can see there, you know, very quickly, it's private until I decide to, you know, offer out a mechanism for connecting to the storage in itself. Uh, and Storage Explorer, I just encourage everyone to use. The other tool, and we definitely won't have time today, given where we are now, is, is AZ Copy as well. So if you do have a lot of copying to do between blobs uh, through the command line, then, then, then that's another, another mechanism for you as well. If we also go back to the Azure portal itself and select this container, same thing, you know, you'll see it in here through Storage Explorer. Uh, you can see it there and you can do all the same kinds of things from here. You can also go into the storage accounts and we'll, again, I'm gonna cover keys in a minute, but if we decide, okay, you know, I've got two keys here on my storage account. If I decide I wanna rotate that key, let's say I give out all my shared access signatures and they're authorized through key one, maybe I generate new SAS tokens with key two and then I can recycle this key and then everybody that had access through that original key uh, will no longer you know, have access to those containers or, or blob files there in itself. So let me um, pause there. Carl, if you want to add anything, if there's any other questions, otherwise I'll, I'll divert to kind of just showing everyone how you can create these with PowerShell as well. Yeah, no, that was fantastic, Nick. Great, great overview. Any uh, we good uh, questions, Tom? Or can uh, we, do, we do have one question from Graham. Uh, if you copy between containers, is it clever enough not to download, upload, and do the copy locally? Uh, great question, Graham. So today, uh, no, it, it is not. There's, uh, you know, no equivalent with, um, with, with our object platform today to effectively move that, right? Like we're used to with, uh, with remote file systems with an SMB uh, share or an NFS export, um, you know, the hosting server will, will essentially just update the, um, uh, the, the metadata to, to place it in, in the, in the new directory. Uh, so today, no, uh, that, uh, that would cause a, a download upload. Great question. I had a more general question. This didn't come from one of our audience members, but myself. Um, is there a difference between Microsoft blob storage offering and the more general concept of object storage, or is that just your name for object storage? That is our uh, unfortunate name for object storage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I make a little tongue in, in cheek joke there, but um, you saw on one of the earlier slides, we, we really for, refer to it as block blob storage, which, which is even more confusing. But at the time it was, it was done for a reason. We, um, we implemented something that's very different from what uh, traditional object storage platforms have brought to market. We, we do break the individual objects, uh, what, what our, our listeners here can think of as, as files, uh, into blocks. And what that allows uh, 
our our customers and our uh, technical partners, our ISVs, to do, who leverage the the Block Blob storage platform, is to do partial updates of uh, of of a blob of an object, and that's really unique. We just talked about the upload download during a move. Well, what if I have to update? part of a file? What if I'm a video production company and I have a 4 gig 4K video file, which would be small for 4K, but large overall, and uh, you know I've edited part of that? Well, um, our REST APIs, which is how you interact with, uh, with the storage uh, platform programmatically, uh, allow you to just upload the portion of that file and modify the existing object that um, that that was originally written, so that can be really advantageous from both a performance perspective and from a, a cost modeling perspective, and uh, it's the reason why we have this kind of, you know, what what seems like an unintuitive name for uh, for for our solution for our platform. All right. Uh, well, I'll keep moving on then. And I, I just deleted my storage account there. And if anyone didn't realize why, it's because those keys were pretty uh, publicly accessible there, and <laughs> obviously recorded. And uh, you know, um, you know, this will obviously be out on the web later on. And certainly want to make sure I, I delete that straight away. But um, I, I promise, Nick, I was not going to bombard that account <laughs> with cat pictures. It was it was <laughs> tempting, but. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so moving on to PowerShell. Well, one quick thing, if no one showed in the previous um, Brown Bank, you can access your PowerShell client directly from the portal now, which I think is just an amazing feature, you know, without having to kind of, you know, download all the modules and log in and everything, you know, you can kind of, you know, set this all, all up directly from here. Um, so in a moment, it'll restart Cloud Shell and, and reconfigure. I've obviously got some something I used here once before that, that's been deleted, um, but it just, it'll open a PowerShell client eventually. Um, but what I can do is also do it from my regular client. So I can log in to, you know, Azure RM account, and, you know, hit that, same kind of thing, you know, as you saw with the Storage Explorer, you know, I can kind of put my credentials in here. It'll take me to my, my sign-in page. And we'll go through that, and then that's that's kind of logged in. Uh, and now at this point, you know, I can create my storage accounts directly from PowerShell. You know, I can also do them from CLI. I can do them from the SDK. There's, there's so many ways to programmatically, you know, kind of do this. But you'll see how quick it is. If I don't want to sit there, you know, in the GUI all the time, I can just tab through here. Give it a name, so we'll call this. Um, we'll put this in the V brown bag. I tab through; it'll show me my my resource groups that I've I've got. Uh, for some reason, it's not. So we will figure that out in a minute. I'll just create a new one for now. Uh, let's see. So we'll call this one VBB temp, and then do give it a name. So for the storage account, we'll call this V brown bag P shell location. Again, I can choose tab through, so I'll do East US 2 again here. And then you will notice something. The only downside right now is when we do enough SKU, I can certainly do premium LRS. But when I choose my kind, you know, you get, you'll get an option between blob or storage. But I don't get the option yet of choosing to do um, GPV2 or GPV1. So, um, but it is important to know. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Let's go back to resource group name here. Uh, it needs an existing resource group. I didn't create a new one, first of all, so let me just go and grab one here again. I'm actually going to just try and type in the one I had, which was V brown bag, and see why it's not taking that. I believe it should. Probably because I logged in earlier on PowerShell. Probably it's cached or something. So we'll see if that uh, takes this time. Okay, there we go. So that's created. So if I should have a storage account named VBP Shell in the V Brown Bag resource group. So we'll close out this this part there, and there we go. VBP Shell. So if we if we go into this one, what we'll notice again is this is currently a GPV one storage account. Um, but if I want to, I can go ahead and go to configuration. 
and upgrade it as well. And it's just worth noting, this is a one-time thing, but if you do have a lot of GPV-1 accounts out there, you can go ahead and just upgrade these you know, directly as well. I know this is an upgrade they bring into PowerShell, so you will be able to create the GPV-2 ones directly from there. In fact, I'll probably use, you know, I bet if I actually went and updated my PowerShell modules this week, it's probably probably already there. So, um, But if not, I, I thought I'd kind of show this just so you know, like if you go to one, it's okay. You can go in here and just click the upgrade button uh, and go in and uh, you know select upgrade, and then that will upgrade your storage account. It's a one-time thing. And then that's now GPV2. There's no data loss or anything when you when you kind of go through that process. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing to know, I know we've got an automation session coming up, which I'll I'll be doing, you know, half on ARM and half Azure automation, and then all sorry, um, half um, Azure automation and ARM, and then the other half uh, HashiCorp Terraform. So I'll be having Hashi on with me to do that, and we'll we'll kind of show you some of these things in there as well. Uh, but to wrap up, I know we're, we're kind of up on time here, so I'm going to kind of uh, jump through some of the, the final uh, key points here. Uh, first thing is, you probably saw everything I did so far was storage account .blob .core .windows net. Don't worry, you can replace that. So this could become Skylines Academy. The blob could then be, you know, slash my container, slash my blob. You know, it could just be your, your URL. You know, root container would just be, you know, the, your, your domain slash my containers. You don't need to stick with those. You can. You can set up custom uh, custom domain mapping as well, uh, and a couple of ways to do it. You can, uh, you know, just um, you know, use your domain and point it to like, you know, sldscdemo.blob.core.windows.net. You know, I can do it that way, uh, or I can use this AS Verify subdomain. Um, and after that completes, you create a you you create a um, AS Verify subdomain. You complete that step, and then you create a scene name record in your DNS for your domain. Um, and the good thing is this doesn't occur; it doesn't incur any any downtime. So a lot of people kind of go this route when you're trying to trying to switch those over. Uh, we kind of mentioned SMB. We didn't really get into tables and files too much, so we'll quickly kind of hit that as well. But a key thing to note is if you're just looking for a NoSQL key value store, you can just put one in your storage account. You can literally go back over. Uh, if I go into the storage account here uh, and go, let's go back here a little bit, sorry. Go into, into this one. And you'll see on the front page, uh, in fact, bear with me, let me just create a new one here. So I wanna show it to you on the welcome page that you get. Another five petabytes at the click of a button here. You still hearing me there, Carl? I didn't know if I lost connection or anything. No, oh, no. I okay. can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. So a little, uh, was being a little delayed there. I don't know if it was a. Uh, I was having a, a Tom issue there talking and then no one's there. So <laughs> well, now we have a new issue, a new name for it. You got Tommed. We're gonna start you got Tommed. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't that's, trying to coin that Tom. <laughs> and that's unfortunately not the first time that that's been an, a, a name for a label of technical difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just get this one created here and then uh, I just want to show you the, uh, the tables here. Any questions again while we uh, wait for paint to dry on the screen, even though it's not that long? I know it's funny, isn't it? It feels like an eternity, <laughs> but when you think about what this took just a couple of years ago, yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, the brave new cloud world is just making us more impatient and different. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just what we needed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's already done in the, the few sentences we managed to, to utter out there. So this is what I was trying to show, is you can see the services here. So I've got this new account, and I can click in here and go to tables. And I can go in here and actually just create a table directly in here. So VBB table, I'll call this for now. Uh, click OK, select this one. Yeah, and these are no SQL, you know, semi-structured style uh, style oh. tables, and yep. you know, all all those modern apps that uh, that make use of that. So I should be able to refresh this in a moment. Yeah, I'm having some connection issue, yeah, but 
bear with me. Well, anyway, the goal would be you'd see a table with key value pairs, just like any uh, any database table that um, that you would typically see. But for whatever reason, that's not showing up. We'll give it another minute here. Yep, not seeing that. No big deal. Um, but hopefully you kind of um, get the point there. We can always uh, recircle back on that one. And same with queues as well. You could also do queue um, queue storage on there. So if we've got queue in systems, you know, a single message can be up to 64 kilobytes in size, uh, and these contain contain millions of messages. But all of these things, the table, the queues, the files, the blobs, you know, all of that can be in the in the same you know storage account in it in itself. And I'll come back and check the tables at the end. The last few things I do want to just make sure I cover is I kind of went through those access policies on SAS and how I created that SAS signature. Uh, so one thing that's important, a shared access signature is nothing more than a query string that we essentially add onto the URL of a, of a storage resource. And that string is what's informing Azure what access should be granted to that resource. And there's two types of these, is the account SAS tokens or the service SAS tokens. So the account SAS tokens, we could grant these at the account level and choose the services we want to allow access to, or we can apply a SAS service SAS token on a specific service that would be tables, queues, files, or blob as an example. And you know, it goes without saying, as you probably saw in the string and you'll see in a moment, there's a hash-based you know, message authentication. So this is how we ultimately secure access to this. The way it breaks down, if we think about it, okay, I want to access the, you know, the, the image like I, like I did before, and I copy that URI, I paste it into my browser, access that image. Um, that's piece one. And then the second piece is this big SAS token, which you look at at first, a lot of people say, well, what is that? I don't understand. Like, it's like okay, well, if you just break it down, um, it's actually pretty easy to kind of, kind of understand. So one, we've got the blob. Uh, two, we've got the storage service version, which is which is created for you automatically. Um, but the pieces that are more important are things like this. So SS is signed services. So if we see BFQT, we've got blob, file, queue, table. So it just matches the the services that we're allowed to access. So if we only allowed the um, we only allowed access to blob, it would only have a B under that that SS. Next, we have the signed resource types. So we have the storage account, the container, and the object available there. And then we have the signed permissions. Not all of these apply to everything because things like append and update apply to like uh, you know, different services. Uh, but read, write, delete, list, append. Um, I'll have to kind of pull up the, the document for the other, the other ones that are on there. But that's saying these are the permissions that you have against that particular blob or container, depending on what we're, what we're giving out. This part's important. So we have the signed expiry and start date. So what we're saying is, you know, I can, you know, it's going to, my access is going to expire at a certain time and I, I can make these, you know, pretty far in advance. You know, I can, um, you know, do whatever I need to do here. Yeah, one key thing though is always just start these a day before. The amount of troubleshooting exercise that happen because of time, time zones aren't taken into account. If you just set the start, if you're going to give the access out anyway, it doesn't matter if it started yesterday. So I always encourage people just start it the day before and not worry about it. So pretty uh, key thing there. Sign protocol, obviously HTTPS here, yeah, and then the signature on the end. So all of that is basically what's making up that SAS signature that's that's giving you the authorization to, to access the blob in itself. Uh, then if you go a step further and you don't want to keep managing these and rotating the keys every time you want to restrict access, you can move on to stored access policies. They're, they're very well documented, much easier way to kind of, you know, give and take away and, and, and recycle, you know, the life cycle of access on, on the objects in themselves. So that's the last part I, I just want to make sure we kind of covered is it's definitely, you know, aside from also creating your own keys and managing your keys, you know, stored access policies and, and shared access signatures are just something that's key to kind of get, get familiar with pretty, pretty quickly. So um, so with that, I would say, because I know we're, we're just over time here, yeah, what are we at, 837 Central, that is, 9, 937 Eastern. Carl, anything else you want to add or anything from the, any other questions we've got, Tom and Ken from the from the brown bag side? Yeah, on, on my side, no. I, I mean, the, you know, the only thing I, I'd like to leave everybody with is it, it should be obvious you've you've got a lot of options here and uh, and there's a bunch we didn't touch on. This, this yeah. is a huge Go area. This, right? uh, you know, we have, <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. There's there's just so much to cover, but um, uh, it, it, I, I hope what's really clear is there's a lot of flexibility. We have storage platforms to support your needs, your application needs, and um, we just continue to innovate at a at a frightening pace. As uh, as I know, both Nick and I will 
will tell you it's uh, it, it's great to see that there's there are so many capabilities being added at a at a feverish pace. Um, and let us know if we're missing something you need. We are we are happy to to provide it and incredibly user focused. Awesome, I think yeah. that's a fantastic way to end off. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. I was gonna say the only question that I've received is how can someone learn more about the uh, tables and use cases of such? Uh, I'd say, I mean, Carl, start with the documentation. I, I, I would point you to my training course, but it's on the certification and tables is only covered at a at a high level there. Um, but I would say, I mean, there's a ton out there on the on the Azure storage site from a documentation standpoint on tables specifically. I would say, honestly, I mean, I, I mean, I've only played around specifically with tables um, to a certain extent, but um, I would just say go in, create a storage account, and I would try to create something in each one of those services. I would start with Blob, get familiar with that, get familiar with shared access signatures, and create in, put in some objects out there, give them permissions, taking them away, then probably move on to files, make sure you know how to create a file share, you know, and access that, and potentially play with file sync if you're gonna be doing on-premises sync with that as well. Uh, and then, yeah, create a table. Um, you know, I can certainly try to refresh again. Yeah, I'm sure I probably just need to update my my clients or something here, but you know, the tables would come up here in the, in the storage account. Um, and then you would see kind of the key value and you know, there's all sorts of permissions you can do against that as well. There's obviously a whole bunch of other database services, you know, that we haven't talked about today, you know, just on the SQL side and, you know, and, and other NoSQL options that are out there as well. Uh, but certainly I would, I would just play, get, get started and play with this and be prepared for things to change as well, which I think is just something we've all just accepted as part of the cloud era. Yeah. And if you're anything like me and you like a combination of, get the foundation, get a basic understanding, and then, you know, you learn best by hands-on. I, I don't think I'm alone in that. Uh, there are a ton of resources. Channel 9, our Channel 9 video yeah. series is invaluable. Uh, look at um, Ignite, ignite.microsoft.com. You can view sessions from prior Ignites, and uh, there's tons out there about storage, and there's content for the IT pro for the developer, and uh, there's no lack of, of information to, to help you on your on your journey. Um, it's it's amazing. Awesome, great, thanks thanks for all that. Ken, do you see anything or are the we Twitter are closer? clear? All right. Great. Thank all you. Right for uh for doing this presentation it's been awesome and you know, when you think of storage you don't think of all these different services so this is great yeah no thank you yeah thanks for having me on and thanks Carl for joining me and yeah thank you everyone just really appreciate it and you know let, let Carl or I know if you have any questions and look forward to seeing you throughout this series so, and absolutely uh, it was a pleasure thank you guys where can we find you if we need to reach out to you or uh want to follow up with your work, your blogs, or whatever. So I have the slide, I'll let Carl kind of maybe put his in the chat, but uh, this is all my uh, my Twitter here, at VNXC, and these are the, the websites. Obviously, I work at AHEAD, where we work with a lot of clients and, and work in our Azure practice, and Skylines Academy, and I'll do my uh, shameless uh, plug here. Um, you know, this is, a, this is the website where I build the training courses, and you know, that, um, you know, right now we've got this Azure certification course out there. If you just want to learn more about VMs, we give that one away for free. And then um, Terraform for Azure we've got coming out next week. So we're uh, pretty excited about that. But yeah, hit me up on, uh, you know, on uh, on Twitter if you if you need anything. And Carl, I guess, how do we get in touch with you? Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. Likewise, I'm, uh, uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, cloud underscore Carl, and that's uh, cloud with a K. I, uh, I got kind of kind of cute there. Carl with a K, cloud with a K. Um, you'll see me do two things. I tweet about Azure, no shock there, and um, good beer. So that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what you'll see. <laughs> All right, great. Well, uh, thanks everyone. Thank you for a great entry into our uh, Azure Foundation series. So. Uh, with that, join us next week as we continue talking about Azure.